Welcome to tonight's Resistance TV broadcast. We're discussing 21st century socialism this evening with Carrie Ann Mendoza, who's the editor at large for The Canary, uh, Tommy Sheridan, who's a commentator and former MSP and leader of the anti poll tax campaign in Scotland, and Ben Norton, who's the assistant editor at The Grey Zone. So, what does socialism in the 21st century actually mean, and how can we achieve it? Uh, people may have uh, heard the quotation from Herbert Morrison, who once said that socialism is what a Labour government does. But whatever the last Labour government did, it certainly wasn't socialism. And corporate capitalism is undoubtedly in crisis and support for socialism is growing around the world. But two of the leading standard bearers for socialism in the UK and US were rejected by the establishment in both their own parties, namely Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, of course. And even though the policies that they were promoting were overwhelmingly popular with the public. There's a famous quote by Lenin, which seems even more apposite today, given the shenanigans in the Labour Party. And he said, the Labour Party is a thoroughly bourgeois party because although made up of workers, it's led by reactionaries. And the worst kind of reactionaries at that, who act quite in the spirit of the bourgeoisie. It's an organisation of the bourgeoisie which exists to systematically dupe the workers. So if the Labour Party is not fit for purpose as a vehicle for socialism, what do we do? Carry on, what do you think? Oh, well, firstly, thanks for having me on tonight, Chris. And I just, I love the theme um, this evening of 21st century socialism, because that's where we need to plant ourselves. I think it's very tempting to kind of look back um, you know, everyone kind of goes back to the Atlee government and the spirit of 45 and say we need to do that. But there were major flaws um, because even that kind of Atlee spirit was very much still a kind of um, industrial socialism that was kind of, for want of a better turn of phrase, a kind of social socialism for white straight people <laughs> that lived in the United Kingdom um, and predominantly England at that. So we're now in a position, I think, where we actually have the opportunity to have really make socialism manifest as it should and that is the socialism that brings all of the working class together whether you're straight whether you're gay whether you're trans black white brown wherever you are in the world and i almost see the difference for me between sort of capitalism or centrism and 21st century socialism as you know the former is right we've got this queue for a handout or for some benefit or for some bit of attention and we're all fighting about getting to be first in that queue and it just pits working class people against other working class people the kind of socialism that we have the opportunity to do now is the socialism where we're all in a circle together we're building things we're sharing things and we're advancing all of our causes because every single one of us deserves the right to live a life free from poverty and strife and prejudice and that's what drew me to socialism in the in the first place it's what gets me up every morning to fight for it today is that sort of unity um and obviously we've seen repeatedly that current institutions um you know the labor party being you know one of them and the democratic party in the states being another one that is not what they are interested in that's not what they're looking at the only time they seem to care about issues of race or gender or anything like that is a sort of tokenistic effort, um, which kind of overlooks the sort of structural barriers um, that mean people are held back, falsely held back from achieving their potential. And remember, every individual person's potential adds up to our collective potential as human beings, you know, as a community of people across the world. Um, so it's a really dangerous ideology. And they've also embraced, you know, there is no alternative yeah, in whole, you know, the idea that there is no alternative to neoliberalism. So that queue where we're fighting to be at the front of it and not be at the back of it is all there is. And, you know, we've seen the impact of that with, you know, whole sections of, of you know, particularly the white working class being lured away by, frankly, fascism, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the far right, because they go, well, if. If there's yeah. only this queue, I'm at least going to make sure I'm at the front of it. So I think that's kind of where we are. Where we go from so here, I think... Then, uh, what would your recipe be then, uh, Kerry-Ann, to 
uh, actually address this. If we, if we feel that the Labour Party has embraced the Tina maxim that there is no alternative to neoliberalism, I mean, I mean, is, is socialism off the agenda now? Then, I mean, in terms of realistically implementing it, or what do we do if the I Labour Party is not? Never, the yeah, I agree with you. It's never been more important than it is right now because. Neoliberalism is late stage, it's in disaster mode. You know, these, these people aren't even working anymore to, to you know, make their companies work or anything. This is a whole wealth extraction um, system that they're, they're doing now. They're sort of rushing to the lifeboats and you know, ferrying themselves off to their mansions while the rest of us suffer the consequences. So socialism has never been more important. And I think it's also important to remember there wasn't always a Labour Party. Mm. <laughs> you know, this, the, the Labour Party, you know, isn't isn't this aged institution that we've had for four or five hundred years. You know, this is the, the Labour Party itself is a relatively new phenomenon in, in terms of human history. So the idea that we couldn't possibly recreate the socialist movement in a different form is frankly laughable. I think it's completely self-defeating. And I think yeah. it keeps people wedded to these institutions that are actually in some ways, I think, distractions. They're kind of ways of containing our ambition rather than having it be fulfilled. So at this stage, with everything we've seen, um, I'm absolutely now for breaking away, um, mm. creating grassroots mo movements. And I think there are many prongs to that. Political education has got to be key among them. Reminding people of what working class history and achievement has actually rested upon because it's woefully absent from, from the discourse, certainly in my generation and I think the generations below. Um, you know, my grandparents' generation was certainly more political than my parents' generation. You know, the idea that you can't talk about politics, like politics is something you leave to the managers. You know, it's, it's, it's not something all of us participate in on a daily basis. So political education is one. Breaking away from institutions that have, have proven over and time and time again to fail us and not represent the very best um, yeah. of us, our spirit and our values. Um, and I think actually to show it in action working. Yeah. I think, you know, the idea of actually creating, you know, the stuff you're talking about, about getting into local communities and creating socialist projects that actually meet people's needs real time, yeah. incredibly powerful because that starts breaking down the biggest barrier in front of us, which is Tina, yeah. the idea that there is no alternative. If we well, start well, let's showing... Let's get into that a little bit later on then in the uh, in the conversation this evening. Let me bring in uh, Tommy then, if I may now then, because uh, obviously, Tommy, you um, were very active in the anti-poll tax campaign, a successful campaign, and uh, uh, I guess you... I've got, got much time for the Labour Party's a vehicle for uh, socialism and it doesn't seem to be a, a vehicle that we could, you know, realistically rely on in the future. Um, what's your take? If, if, if the traditional parties, certainly in England, um, obviously you're based up in Scotland, I mean, what, mm. what can talk us through what's the situation do you feel in Scotland in particular and for the UK as a whole in terms of the prospects of of delivering socialism, what do you think the mechanisms that we should be looking to try to create to to do that? Well, first of all, Chris, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure and a privilege to take part in the discussion. And and I want to applaud what Kerry has said. I, I think she has made a great case for twenty first century socialism, and I certainly concur with just about everything she said. You mentioned the, the poll tax and uh, obviously that makes me feel old because it was over 30 years ago, Chris, that we, we were at the barricades uh, melting down the Iron Lady and sending her off to the political knacker's yard where she belongs. Um, but what was important and what is an absolute lesson to take on board from those days was the poll tax wasn't led by any political party. The poll tax was a grass roots campaign from the bottom up. In fact, the poll tax campaign was a product of being abandoned by the official political establishment. The trade union movement, the TUC, the Labour Party, they frowned on the idea of civil disobedience because when you're fed up writing letters of protest, when you're fed up voting against particular politicians, when you're fed up signing petitions, what do you do next? You know, I used to laugh, Chris, that the, the Labour Party um, in those days used to say that the poll tax was immoral. 
It was immoral. And I used to say it myself, well, see if it's immoral, why are you telling us to pay it? <laughs> if yeah. something's immoral, why are we paying it? Uh, and I couldn't understand that the uh, absolute paucity of understanding of history, because without civil disobedience, of course, we wouldn't have trade unions. We wouldn't have a Labour Party. We wouldn't have a Labour movement. And here we had a campaign in 1989. We had it in Scotland first, as you know. We got it a year earlier than, than England and Wales. And we had a campaign that was set aside. That was for the nutters. It was for the, the malcontents. It wouldn't go anywhere. And, of course, one year into it, there was one million people in Scotland refusing to pay the poll tax. Now, I have to say, Chris, not because of Tommy Sheridan or any other recruiting sergeant. The single biggest recruiting sergeant to the anti-poll tax army was poverty. Was poverty itself. People couldn't afford to pay. We have 30 years on, Chris. We have similar levels of deprivation, poverty. We have inequality that's way worse than what it was 30 years ago. It's obscene the levels of inequality that we have in society, but we don't have a political party that articulates the anger for a wee while there, Chris. I, I mean, I, I'm in Scotland and I've got to say, I want to break the British Union because the British Union for me uh, represents imperialism. It represents exploitation. It represents everything that is wrong with society in terms of greed, uh, and the way that they use slavery to build up their wealth and then refuse to apologise apologize or give repatriation. So I want to break the British Union, and that's why Scotland politically, in my opinion, is different from England. Um, it's also different from Wales, but I've got to say, I think there's evidence that Wales is catching up. Uh, I'm not sure there's evidence that England's catching up yet, Chris. I've got to say that. Maybe it's just that I'm not reading the right material or whatever. But what is clear is that Scotland is to the left on the political spectrum to England. And the evidence of that isn't just that we haven't voted for a Tory party for 65 years. But when England embraced that bumbling idiot Boris Johnson in December, Scotland rejected them, rejected everything that they, they stand for. And they voted for a political party. And let's remember what this political party stands for. It's not a socialist party. SNP is not a socialist party. And yet it stands for unilateral nuclear disarmament. It stands for the abolition of the House of Lords. It stands for welcoming refugees. It stands for a publicly owned national health service. And crucially, it stands for Scotland having the right to reclaim its independence as a nation as we once were. Now, all of that means then, Chris, the on the left in Scotland, and by the way, the SNP as a political party has its problems as well in terms of the direction it's going in. But right now, in the absence of any alternative, I would argue that socialists have to endorse a vote for the SNP to break the British Union. Once it's broken, once it's broken, and I, I, when I say breaking, I don't mean just Scotland, I mean Wales, and I mean Ireland. A, a united Ireland, I think, is now closer than ever. Uh, and that's something that we should should be celebrating as well. Once that happens, I think, by example, if we do the right things in Scotland, if we implement a living wage instead of a poverty minimum wage, if we do have a publicly owned pharmaceutical industry that actually feeds our national health service instead of exploiting our national health service, if we have a national energy company that provides the energy on the basis of need, not on the basis of private profit, these things can show an example that a working class of England will say, hey, we want some of what the jobs are getting. We want to follow that example. And that's why, Chris, I would argue we are in a different situation in Scotland. That's not to say there isn't a need for a socialist movement in Scotland. There is, but there is a bigger need in England right now. And quite frankly, with what's been happening recently with Jeremy, if the left and the trade unions don't act now, they'll never act. And I'm sort of trying to encourage, uh, you know, people on the left, groups on the left, trade unions to uh, to work together, to come together, to recognise that the Labour Party is broken uh, and there's no means of, of repairing it. And we really do need, I'm in my opinion anyway, and I never thought I'd be saying this because I spent 44 years of my life inside the Labour Party to sort of uh, break out and, and start again. Tony Benn. 
as I keep saying, used to talk about the cuckoos, the new Labour cuckoos taking over the Labour nest. And they've now taken it over and destroyed it, broken all the eggs, and we've no means of putting them back together. So we need to start building a new nest. But I just wanted, just before I bring in Ben, uh, briefly, if I may, uh, Tommy, um, you talk about Scotland and, and, and it's, you know, we, you know the, the kind of legendary kind of Red Clyde side and so on. And uh, there's always been that um, tradition in, in certain, in the kind of urban parts of Scotland. But Scotland uh, as a country, uh, you know, but going back into the 1950s, for example, was, was quite conservative, wasn't it? I mean, and what happened? I mean, and, you know, is there a formula that you can sort of export to us in England? Because you clearly turned it around. And I know that New Labour screwed it up. Um, but nevertheless, that sort of, uh, you know, left wing mentality, that sort of progressive um, solidarity, sort of sense of solidarity, I think, as, as pertained. And, and it's great to see. And, you know, I do, you know, I'd like to obviously implement that here if we could. Um, what, what happened? Well, what happened? 19, 1955 was the last time that yeah. the Conservatives won a majority in Scotland, as you, as you know. They've never, ever won a majority in Scotland since 1955. So it is a complete and utter distant memory. What I would say to you is, however, Chris, New Labour began the process, and it wasn't a very quick one. It started slowly, but it began a process of Labour's vote declining. It wasn't that Labour wasn't the dominant force during Tony Blair. It was, but it was the dominant force in the absence of any alternative. And I'll tell you what happened, because if you look at the 2010 general election, you will see that Labour won over 40 of the 59 seats that were available to Westminster. 2010. By 2015, Labour was reduced to one. One seat in Westminster. Five years, Labour's vote disappeared like snow melting on a dike. What happened was the 2014 referendum. The 2014 referendum was an energizing exercise, Chris, that mobilized literally millions of working class people across Scotland who for the first time began to realize that there is an alternative. It was interesting what Terry was saying earlier about having to fight against Tina. There is no alternative. Of course, there's an alternative. And we have to always fight to put the alternative. And in 2014, the idea that another Scotland was possible began to be grasped by ordinary people in Scotland. And if you can think about it, in 2013, when David Cameron agreed to the referendum, support for independence was around 22%. He he agreed because he thought it would get squished. And by 2014, we had over 45%. Uh, That was a remarkable achievement in the teeth of British establishment mobilisation to tell us that we weren't big enough, we weren't smart enough, we weren't rich enough, that we couldn't stand on our own two feet. But what happened was the young people of Scotland voted for independence. And there's now been, Chris, 14 successive opinion polls, 14 successive opinion polls saying Scotland is for independence. But here's the rub. Look at the young people in those polls. It is now at 80 percent young people saying we are for independence. That's a march that cannot be halted. The no, fact of independence is is now on the agenda. Britain Incorporated is dead. All we have to do is arrange the funeral, Chris, and it will be a very celebratory funeral. Mm, no, indeed. I look forward to the day, actually, when we perhaps uh, move from the United Kingdom to the uh, the Union of uh, Socialist Republics. Yes. That would be quite nice, wouldn't it? But um, let me move on to uh, to Ben, if I can, and uh, just get Ben's thoughts, because uh, obviously in the US, socialism was a dirty word for, for a very long time. And uh, Bernie Sanders uh, burst onto the scene, at least ways, that's how it appeared to us on this side of the Atlantic, and it seemed to really capture the zeitgeist, really. There was a lot of uh, support, it seemed, for uh, his ideas. Uh, socialism was no longer a dirty word, and I saw some polls suggesting that there was a substantial uh, proportion, uh, particularly of younger people, who actually 
a favoured socialism, uh, actually, as 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 a uh, a political ideology. And you know, Bernie was the 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 archetypal, I suppose, anti-establishment um, uh, candidate. But the against against um, Trump. But obviously, the establishment, the, the, the Democrat establishment, that is, saw to it that he didn't get the nomination, both in 2016 and put up, uh, you know, a pillar of the uh, of Wall Street. And um, I know that Biden got over the line this time, but he, but he's uh, hardly a, um, uh, a sort of uh, a progressive figure when you look at his record under Obama and indeed uh, prior to that. Um, so what's what's the future? Do you think, Ben, for for socialism? In the U.S. and around the world, and I know that you've been in uh, Bolivia and 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 other nations in uh, Latin America, where obviously there has been a resurgence of a, of a socialist uh, ideology and um, support for it. There is, is seems to be strong, even when it's been pushed back a bit. The, the residually, there's been a real kind of strength in in depth, and they've been able to come back. And it's fantastic what's obviously happened in in Bolivia. But perhaps if you just give us your take on on the situation in the US um, with what happened with Bernie, uh, what the prospects are under Biden. And there is talk about that, you know, he's gonna go left now, he's gonna tack left. Um, but from what I've seen, I mean, it didn't seem as if Bernie had secured any cast iron guarantees, but anyway, you tell us your, from your perspective, uh, Ben, because you're close to it than we are. Well, I'll begin just saying that the idea that Joe Biden is going to move left, I think, is wishful thinking at best. I would say it's actually it's delusion. There's no indication whatsoever. There never was an indication. Joe Biden is a right wing Democrat. His entire career has been as a right wing Democrat under Barack Obama. He was even to the right of Obama, who is a neoliberal through and through, who talked about the importance of the free market, who oversaw one of the largest wealth transfers in history from the working class to billionaire oligarchs after the financial crisis. And we, can, we only expect at this moment that Biden is going to be even more to the right of the centrist, neoliberal, center-right Barack Obama administration. Of course, you know, you all know as, as people from the UK, as Europeans, that the US is an extremely right-wing country when it comes to formal, you know, bourgeois electoral politics. It's extremely right wing. And unfortunately, uh, the Democratic Party has has hinted in no way that it's going to move left. In fact, it's been the exact opposite. The Democratic Party every four years has continued to move further and further to the right. And with the Biden victory, it's only further confirmation to the Democratic Party's neoliberal leadership that their strategy of continuing to tag to the right is supposedly a successful one. We've already seen with the people that Biden has named that the Biden-Harris transition team have named to oversee what they call their agency review teams. We see that the vast majority of them are neoliberals, corporate lobbyists. They, in the case of his so-called national security team, these are lifelong war hawks who supported the Iraq war, the Libya war, the Syria war, the war in Yemen, people who have worked for the weapons industry, who work for very aggressive, hawkish, neoconservative think tanks. There, there certainly is no, I don't think there's any realistic sign that Biden is going to move left. It's, it's actually the contrary. He's going to continue to move right. And so this raises the important question that we're discussing today. Where will socialism potentially come from in terms of social movements in the United States? And, and I think the, the answer is that it can't come within the Democratic Party. And I think it's very similar, the situation in the U.S., to what you all have seen with the Labor Party, although I would argue that the U.S. is always maybe 20 years ahead when it comes to neoliberal policies. So we've, it's been very clear since Bill Clinton's time that the Democratic Party is not a vehicle for the left wing. This was the rise of the third way Democrats. Bill Clinton mm -hmm. wholeheartedly embraced neoliberal policies. In fact, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton accomplished what Ronald Reagan was not able to do in privatizing welfare, essentially destroying welfare, in deregulating Wall Street, in deregulating the media. In, in doing so many things that the Republican Party, ostensibly the right wing party, wanted to do, well, it was actually the Democrats that under the neoliberal leadership after the Clintonian turn that was able they were able to accomplish that. And we've seen 
under Obama and likely under Biden, only a further continuation of that neoliberal trajectory, just as we saw with Tony Blair under the UK Labour Party. And you mentioned Bernie Sanders. You know, you did say that Bernie Sanders, it seemed like he came out of nowhere. Well, what's interesting about Bernie is that he has been involved in US politics in a formal way for decades. And he has actually, he's a mem an independent member of the Senate. He is one of the only independents who has ever been elected to the Senate in the history of the United States. There are very few, you can count them on two hands. And the fact that he was an independent is very important. He ran for president as a Democrat, but he is not a Democrat, he's an independent. And because there's no significant third party in the United States, and because our system is even less democratic than that of the United Kingdom, which certainly isn't very democratic either, but because we have this presidential system, it's even more difficult to build a third party alternative. I actually think in the UK, I think, I think it's something that we have to do in the United States and it's something that I encourage and have tried to be part of, encouraging the creation of a new third party, whether it be called a workers party or a progressive party, or the name is not as important. What That's secondary, what's primary is that we need an independent party that is not accountable to the Democratic Party's funding base, which is Wall Street, the pharmaceutical industry, the fossil fuel industry. And mm. the reality is that in the US, that's even more difficult. But in the, in the UK, with a parliamentary system, I think it's something that in the near term is a, is a plausibility. I, in, the, in the United States, we're thinking kind of medium long term. But finally, yeah, I mean, I'll say here. Policy, ben, isn't there in, uh, the, I mean, is that gaining much traction in, in uh, the States? I'm sorry, you cut off at the beginning. Is what gaining traction? Sorry, you know, I'm just saying, Ben, there, there is a movement which I saw uh, for a people's party, and they, they had a, uh, uh, a convention, I think, in the autumn. Uh, is there much traction with that? Are they, are they gaining a lot of support? Do you think it's got a realistic prospect of, of making an impact on the, on the Senate, on uh, governor races in the, in the states, ultimately the presidency, or is it, is it wishful thinking? And, um, and are they are they socialist inclined as well? Of course, that's another important point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is this is a movement that is led by this guy, Nick Brana, who used to work for the Bernie campaign and during his first presidential campaign. And he re recognized that there are so many structural impediments inside the Democratic Party that would never allow a candidate, even a, a kind of milk -and toast social Democrat like Bernie Sanders, who in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom would be, frankly, a centrist member of the Labour Party. But the Democratic Party is just so undemocratic that he recognized the need to create a new party. And yeah, it's a kind of socialistic oriented progressive party. But the reality is that that's still in its infancy. And, and this is a movement I support, but they don't have any elected members of office. You know, there's a there's a big debate about the path forward for socialists and people who are inclined towards socialism in the United States. And, and I can get to that in a second, but I actually think what's more instructive than looking at the United States, because this is an example of a country where the left has really never succeeded, frankly. I mean, you can maybe say Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had a very mixed bag when it came to his policies. He definitely accomplished some social democratic policies, but there were a lot of horrible things that FDR oversaw, including Jim Crow, including mass internment camps for Japanese Americans, etc. But so I, I think a lot of people, well, actually, maybe not a lot of people, but I think some people look at the movement of the left in the United States and try to learn lessons from it. Well, there certainly are lessons that we can learn from it, and, and I can talk about those, but I think there are infinitely more lessons we can learn from other countries where socialism has been successful. And, and what I was going to say is I'm glad you mentioned Latin America earlier. I just wanted to pivot really quickly and address that because, you know, th this term, socialism in the 21st century, the person who popularized that term was Hugo Chavez of, of Venezuela. He, he was the one, the term was created by a German political scientist, but it was Hugo Chavez who popularized it at the World Social Forum in 2005 when he gave a, a famous speech declaring that the Bolivarian Revolution he had declared, which, you know, Hugo Chavez won the democratic election in Venezuela in 1998 and came into power and didn't declare himself a socialist until several years into power after a, a failed U.S. coup attempt in 2002, after an oil lockout, a boss's strike tried to derail him, and all of these things, 
And it, he was radicalized through that process. And Hugo Chavez famously said that the Bolivarian Revolution is also a socialist revolution before it had been a, a very progressive nationalist anti-imperialist movement in Latin America. And that ushered in a wave of very similar progressive socialist governments in Latin America. Of course, the, the most well-known, a lot of people have probably heard of Evo Morales in Bolivia. He also created a new party that had its origins in the social movements. It's called the Movement Toward Socialism Party, MAS. But the full name of it is actually MAS-IPSP, which is a very long name, but it stands for the Movement Toward Socialism, the Popular Instrument for the Sovereignty of the Peoples. And that second part is important because Evo Morales saw that party as the party is itself the political instrument for the social movements. And Bolivia is an incredible example, I think, of socialism in the 21st century because the base of the party are the social movements. The base of the party are the unions. Bolivia is one of the most highly unionized countries in the world. It's the largest in Latin America. There are six union federations which are extremely powerful, especially among the indigenous majority of the population, the, the poorest, most humble people in Bolivia. They're extremely well organized. And so when there was a coup backed by the United States and, and the right-wing oligarch elites who are extremely racist in November of 2019, one of the reasons that the socialist movement in Bolivia was able to successfully defeat the coup regime peacefully through the ballot box with votes, I think there are a few important things to learn from that lesson. One, it was because the union movement was so well organized, the labor movement, that they were able to have mass strikes and shut down the country and prevent the coup regime from being able to govern. And it was actually, the coup regime delayed the election three times. There was supposed to be an election within three months of coming to power in November. They delayed it three times. And the only reason they finally agreed to have the election is because the labor movement had so demobilized the country, blocked all the roads, had massive protests. They made the country so ungovernable that the coup regime had to agree to have the elections or not even be able to govern. So there's a, there's ma a major lesson there from, from Bolivia, and they successfully came back to power in October of, of this year the, at the ballot box. Yes. No, I mean, and it's, really boring. And I just, I mean it's great to see what happened in, in Bolivia. And I mean, for me, that, that it really is a salutary lesson for us. Do you think there is lessons that, that can be applied in the UK, in the US, elsewhere in the world uh, from what? Has been achieved in Bolivia and and other and other Latin American countries. You know that the force of the of those kind of grassroots movements, rather than simply an electoral strategy. I, I mean, I, I've been talking about the need for a twin track approach. Yes, an electoral strategy is required to capture the instruments of power, but unless you've got a social movement, then that electoral strategy. If we put our legs in that electoral uh, strategy. The political parties, like the Labour Party, like the Democrats, like other political parties, I think, who, who focus exclusively on an electoral strategy, lose their way and, and come out, become out of touch. I mean, the Labour Party today, from what it originally was established to be, it's a million miles away. And uh, so I, I don't, it seems to me anyway, you know, that, that that is a lesson that we should be learning. But do you think from your sort of very close quarters experience of reporting on, on uh, Bolivia and other Latin American countries, do you think there is... A, a, a realistic way in which we can, you know, replicate some of the fantastic achievements that the socialist movement has achieved there, in in the UK, in the US, and as I say, in other other, you know, Western 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 sort of liberal democracies. Absolutely, I think there are a lot of lessons, and I'll say not just Bolivia. What's interesting is if you look at this idea of the pink tide, which is not really a term used here in Latin America. I should mention I, I live in Nicaragua, which also has an elected socialist government, the Sandinista Front. And sure. there, there, they, there's a lot of lessons to learn from Nicaragua. There are many lessons to learn from the movements in Brazil and Ecuador and Argentina. All of these governments were relatively recently or currently back once again are socialist oriented. So I think that in terms of the countries in Latin America that are perhaps most similar politically to the United Kingdom and the United States, we can look maybe more toward Argentina and Brazil 
in terms of the the economic situation, in terms of the composition of the economy and the material conditions of how society is organized, especially in terms of Brazil with the massive population. I think if you look at all of these countries, there are a few lessons that are that tie them all together that can be learned. One, the these movements never came to power through one of the traditional bourgeois parties being co-opted. That that just has not happened. It has not been successful. Really, I can never think of a, a single example of it ever happening. So in the case of uh, Brazil, another country where Lula da Silva, the most popular president in Brazil's history, was a self-declared socialist. He came out of the, the labor movement once again. He was a union organizer, and he created a new movement. He created a new party, the Workers' Party, which was closely linked to the social movements at the base, which was founded by not just leftist intellectuals, but also the labor movement and grassroots activists. I think that is an extremely important combination. It has to have the combination, like you said, of the social movements and the labor movement with political intellectuals and academics. Because so unfortunately on the left, there's often, it, it errs on the side of having too many intellectuals and, and not enough labor organizers. So I think there's a lot to learn from the Workers' Party in Brazil and also Dilma Rousseff, who succeeded Lula. And, and of course, we can talk about why they lost power. In a, I mean, it, there was a soft coup against them in, in a similar way that there yeah, was a kind cool. of soft coup against Jeremy Corbyn. But I think there, that's one major yeah. lesson. And then if, if you look at also Rafael Correa in Ecuador, he also created his own party once again Indeed. in all of these countries. And in Argentina, yeah. finally, I'll just say really quickly here is I think if you look at the social composition, and the economic composition of Argentina, I think it it's a little more similar. There's not as much of an agricultural base to the population and the the economy is is largely based in urban areas and there's agricultural production but it's it's more industrialized in other parts of latin america so you could say that there are parallels with the situation maybe in europe and in argentina once again nestor kirchner who ushered in this this wave of a kind of socialism in the 21st century he once again did not come through the traditional bourgeois parties he created his own party and a lesson that we can learn from there as well is that Kirchner, who was very close to the labor movement, he also drew on a kind of nationalist history of Peron Peronism, which is very complicated. But the point is yeah. that in all of these movements, they had a kind of indigenous element of their own kind of local history. And I think if you look in Scotland, for instance, the SNP has in, in Ireland can have you know a similar nationalist bent, which can be progressive. Unfortunately, in, in England itself, there's not really a progressive nationalism that can be drawn on. But if you look today in Argentina, the, the left is back in power and they did it through through consolidating that kind of nationalist base and unifying in a popular front they call the Frente de Todos, the, the, fr the everyone front. And that includes a coalition of a bunch of left wing parties and left wing groups. So I, th I think there's you know, a list here of many lessons that we can learn that can be repeated, especially in, in a parliamentary system in the United Kingdom. Yeah. No, so thank I you. I wonder if it's, I, I wonder I mean, if it's possible. Out. Carry on. I oh, sorry. Possible, I wonder oh. if it's possible, Chris, to make the point. I'm so glad Ben finished there with a wee reference to Scotland because I was yeah. I was champing at the bit to, to, to make this point because one of the, I think, defining elements of all of the wonderful movements that Ben has outlined there is anti-imperialism that's yeah. underlined mm -hmm. all of those movements and a progressive nationalism. We, because if you think of England, you don't think that nationalism can be progressive. Mm -hmm. But I remember visiting Venezuela in 2003, Chris. I, I, was, I wanted to interview Hugo Chavez about the Bolivarian revolution. And I wanted to pose the question, is it a socialist revolution or is it a nationalist revolution? I wanted to pose the question. I couldn't get to interview him. I got to, to shake his hand and, and meet him because in those days, uh, security was very tight. There had been an attempted coup again. So things were very, very difficult. But I did get to interview the vice president, Jose Vicente Rangel, who was a wonderful, wonderful man, the founder of the Young Communist League in, in, in Venezuela. In fact, when I said to Jose Vicente Rangel, I, I said, do you support the measures of the Hugo Chavez uh, uh, government? Uh, Jose Vicente Rangel said, well, it's the first government in my lifetime that hasn't jailed me. So I feel it's quite progressive. Yeah. So I thought, I thought that was indicative of the way um, <laughs> government was governing. But what he said to me, Chris, 
was he said that the winds of change are blowing across Latin America. And the winds of change were on the back of the Bolivarian Revolution. We would never, ever, we would never, ever criticize the Cubans for having such a proud uh, attachment to their nationality. We would never criticize the Venezuelans for believing in their nationality or the Argentinians. And yet, and yet, and this is one of my criticisms of the left in Britain, Chris, far too few of the British left recognize Scotland's indigenous right to independence. Uh, and we, I think, are being fired up uh, by that whole idea of nationalism can be civic, it can be humanitarian, it can be progressive, it's not always reactionary. Yeah, let me. Let I think you. that's the key point there, Tommy. It's the Go on, sorry, yeah, it's the, the winds of change. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say, like, I'm I'm now based in Wales. I'm in the valleys, a proper spit and sawdust working class valleys town, um, and it has been a revelation to me. A totally different culture. For I'm from Bristol originally, and kind of there, it, you know, working class is a thing to be ashamed of. You know, you, it's a moniker that you want to drop as quickly as possible um, and become middle class because otherwise you're deemed to have kind of failed in life. There is no solidarity. It is a very small group of people um, on, on the left there in that sort of working class identity. And what I've really noticed here are two things in the, in the sort of year that I've been here. One is there is a genuine pride and an identity as a working class person that is shared it's like a common identity that people are actually proud of. They're proud of getting their hands dirty. Yeah. And the other, the other element of it is the shocking rise of, of the independence movement, particularly just this past six months. It has been breathtaking. Um, yes, Cymru, which is sort of the, you know the, the independence kind of you know campaign group here, and Plaid Cymru is sort of the political expression of that. Um, yes, Cymru had like two thousand members in March. Of this year, you know, and, and you know, independence was kind of a bit of a joke. Now they've just topped fifteen thousand members, and polling is showing we're already starting to nudge up towards forty percent. It's over that in the youth. Same as Tommy's pointing out for Scotland, the younger people seem to be more pro it. And again, it's those dividing lines that people are seeing about a difference of culture between this sort of England, which is this imperialist. You know, kind of capitalist, really brutal, individualized um, system of, of sort of creating a society, and they're watching it fail. Yeah. Frankly, you know, look at the difference in the in the success of handling COVID. You know, the pandemic in the devolved nations versus England is not even close as a comparison. And they're actually saying, "Wait, this isn't so much of a risk anymore, guys." You know, that the risk is staying in this union. The risk is being dragged to the far right of the political spectrum, like the English yeah. working class were. We're not going to let that happen here. We're not going to let ourselves be broken apart. And that's really exciting because I think, again, when we're talking about alternatives, you see an independent Scotland, you see an independent Wales, you see a reunified Ireland, and they're off doing well, and poverty's going down, employment's going up, you know, their health systems are thriving. I think that's going to have a serious impact on the English working class as well. I think that is going to start bleeding into that culture there and people kind of awake from this horrible nightmare that there is no alternative. Let's just all fight amongst ourselves for the scraps. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I'm very alive to is the fact that the, the far right are also organising, just as we are trying to build a, a progressive anti-imperialist grassroots movement, one which, you know, very much prides itself on having an internationalist perspective and one of the reasons why we we do cover international issues on our weekly uh, live stream that we're on this evening is to really kind of make those connections i mean just a few weeks ago we had some people on from nigeria talking about the end sars campaign for example and uh, yeah. you know it's inspiring to see some of the uh, uh, the the movements that are fighting against all the odds and making real significant progress in Latin America, mm. in uh, in uh, nations in Africa, and so on. And of course, in Europe as well. You know, in in in, mm. in in Greece, we saw the rise of Syriza. We've seen Podemos coming to the fore 
in Spain as well. So there's no reason why, you know, we can't replicate some of that. Yeah. Uh, it, is an, it is an oddity, it seems to me, why, you know, there is this kind of working class tradition in, in Scotland and, and in Wales that you mentioned. Um, I think there, you know, places like Liverpool is a similar sort of culture, I guess, but it is something that we need to urgently, in my opinion, and why we're trying to sort of build, and it's been difficult because of the lockdown to organise, and obviously we can't have public uh, meetings in that sense, but we're trying through uh, a, a range of uh, Zoom meetings to pull people uh, together. We start, you know, trying to build and organise on on the ground in, in different localities in every corner of the nation, because if we don't do that, I mean, the Labour Party's failed us, as we've, as I think we're all agreed, and and the far right will will certainly pick up any kind of and fill any vacuum, I think, which is which is left behind. So it's so important. And one of the things that really inspired me about Jeremy's leadership was when he was talking about, uh, you know, creating a social movement. And uh, I mean, I told the trying to sort of promote that and I think that was one of the reasons amongst many that I was targeted by the parliamentary <laughs> Labour Party because I was very much in favour of a grassroots a democracy a sort of participatory democracy for mm. for, for the party uh, members in that sense but you know in view of the uh, the rise in inequality and poverty and the fact that we have in the fifth biggest economy in the world 40 million people uh, living in poverty in this country um mm. I mean, what t would you suggest then that we ought to be doing um, over and above what we're already doing? Uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, trying to build a movement. Are there any other thoughts, Carrie Anne, in relation to what we should be doing to, you know, reach out to people and inspire people and and encourage those who are still stuck in the mentality of there is only one way of fighting the Tories and that's through the Labour Party? My worry is that, there isn't much difference now between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party. If, if Labour gets in with the present leadership, the status quo will prevail. The neoliberal status quo will prevail. And there is a crisis of democracy. So what do you think we can do? What would you be your recommendation to anybody watching this who's a member of the Labour Party now, not sure wh wh whether to stay? Because there's this, uh, what is it, sort of don't leave organised and people are getting yeah. involved in that. Or, or do you I think, think people I think the issue with... Yeah, I think, to be honest, I think I don't think we're going to have to do much at this point, because I think there is enormous anger um, across the kind of socialist left that, that kind of really came to the fore during the Corbyn years, um, real woken, um, you know, from the sort of political wilderness. Um, with quite a shock, let's be honest, in 2015, you know, no, <laughs> no one could kind of call that. Um, and now they're in a position where... You know, I have enormous respect and empathy for Corbyn. You know, that what he's been through this five years, I don't think any of us would want to go through. But the issue is, actually, lots of us have been through it. Yeah. You know, there are there are a lot of people on the socialist left, whether they're former MPs, you know, or journalists or activists who have actually been on the front lines of this battle, who have been doorstepped, who have been character assassinated, who have suffered all of these same slings and arrows. And they stood strong and they fought and they didn't let their comrades down through fear of what the consequences would be if they put their head above the parapet. And that group is now energised and furious because there's no fight happening that they can join in with at the leadership level. As far as the Labour left is concerned, you know, we're still at the petitions and not even strongly worded letters stage. And you can feel that sort of pop bubbling. And I think it's really about showing up now and being very visible and demonstrative mm. and straightforward um, in opposing all of these things absolutely fearlessly and forgetting the mealy mouth conciliatory we can all unite nonsense we're not going to unite there is there is no shared politics between centrism you know neoliberal centrists mm. and socialists there is no bloody middle ground they're opposing ideologies so that needs to happen. And I actually think a big rump of that Labour left will come along anyway, because they are itching, they are desperate for somebody, something to hold on to and move yeah. forward and continue and well, continue that fight. And I mean, they I, do I've not have it right now. Well, I've been inundated with, with you know with people saying you know we've you know, set up a new party. But for me, it can't be, it shouldn't be about one individual. It needs to be a kind of no. grassroots led 
uh, movement in that sense. And and this, you know, the learning from that Latin American experience of, mm. uh, of the Bolivian experience in particular that Ben was uh, talking about, that's so crucial uh, for, for me in that sense. But I've been particularly disappointed, I've got to say, with the the so-called socialist campaign group of Labour MPs mm. because they've been merely mouthed in their support for Jeremy Corbyn. A substantial number of them haven't supported him at all. Some have actually come out and directly attacked him. Um, there were no, there was no support for me or anybody else, any of the other victims of the of the witch hunt. Uh, you know, Ken Livingstone, a man who's done more, in my opinion, than, than any prominent figure to um, fight the cause of anti-racism from his time as the leader of the Greater London Council. He earned the soubriquet as a lefty, partly because of his stance on on anti-racism. He was thrown under the bus, bus, and so many others were, others were as well. Jackie Walker, you know, the the black Jewish woman vice chair of Momentum was accused of anti-Semitism thrown under the bus. I mean, it was nothing to do with anti-Semitism in reality. It was uh, it was a kind of the Zionist lobby. It was the kind of, uh, the, you know, the military industrial complex. It was the anti kind of socialist lobby, the kind of neoliberal status quo uh, lobby, uh, all kind of combining to, uh, together. And I think the mistake that the people around Jeremy made was in advising him to uh, make concessions, to capitulate, to prostrate himself in front of the Zionist Board of Jeopardies and Jewish Leadership Council. I mean, the, these characters are Tories to to uh, to an individual, actually. They're certainly right-wing yeah. uh, Labour, if, if, if there are any Labour supporters uh, amongst them, but, um, and all support the, the, the kind of, uh, the, the appalling uh, of, uh, racist uh, apartheid state of Israel. And that, that, that is, that is that their kind of top top priority, and to try and sort of appease these characters, it was never going to work. And I think Jeremy would have been far better to have defended his reputation, to have called them out for what their real motivations yeah. are, and to have defended the Labour Party's reputation and defended the activists who were being his Praetorian Guard being thrown under the bus. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, as I said from Ken to Jackie, and hundreds and thousands of of ordinary grassroots uh, members who were uh, who were just sort of sacrificed and for no good purpose. I mean, you know, I was making this point two and a half to three years ago. We dug out a speech actually on the day that Jeremy was suspended where I was actually making this very point. It's not me that they're interested in. I'd be collateral yeah. damage. Ultimately, they want to take down Jeremy and they want to destroy this movement. You know, it's unconscionable to have a socialist leader of the opposition, let alone the prospect of a socialist in number 10 Downing Street promoting mm. an ethical foreign policy, promoting socialism at home. And they did everything they could to take him down. And now they're sort of doing their level best to ensure that there is no trace left of that mm. inside the Labour Party so it can never come back. So that's why I think it's so important that we look to build something else. It's not going to happen inside the Labour Party. And all the energy that people, yeah. and I say this with a heavy heart, you know, because I stuck with the Labour mm. Party for 44 years, but all the energy that people are putting into trying to fight for the Labour Party, it's going to end in tears, it won't get them anywhere. That energy, just imagine if you put that energy into helping us build a new movement. It would help us to, I think, uh, really cut through and, and make a difference on the ground, doing politics with people. That was the thing I was always mm -hmm. very passionate about. We've got to find a way of doing politics with people, not to people. Yeah. And, and, you know, too much of this, you know, and we just got to find well, a different way, I think. But look, let me go to uh, Sean now, because I guess I'll have been... Um, uh, comment from uh, our viewers and uh, it's important in the, in the last few minutes to hear what people have said and, and if they've got any questions or comments they want to put to any of our guests this evening. So over to you, Sean. Oh, good evening, Chris and uh, everyone on the panel. The chat rooms have been going absolutely mad again tonight. Uh, I think we've got record numbers on. Um, the Canary have joined us on Facebook, so uh, big shout out to all their uh, subscribers over there. Um, we've got over uh, 170 people over on YouTube and we've got about 40 on Facebook. So, you know, in my reckoning, that's probably nearly, you know, three to three to four hundred people watching this live. Um, so big shout out to everybody who's been uh, who's tuned in tonight and has joined into the dis joined in with the discussion. Um, the main message is coming across tonight is that we need a new party. People are saying that um, they want to leave or they have left. They're absolutely disgusted with what's happened today uh, with Starmer um, removing the whip from Jeremy Corbyn, and um, they're desperate for a new uh, a new political party to move to. Um, so we've had lots of questions coming in. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to ask them all. Um, so um, I'm just going to go to uh, a first question from Shamsha Chohan, um, which I think sums up uh, quite well a lot of the questions that we've been getting in. 
What do the panel think the biggest myths are around socialism? <laughs> well, I think that I'll jump in, Sean. I think one of the biggest myths that has to be tackled is that we want to level down. Uh, yeah. We don't want to take away people's lovely houses and we, we don't want people not to be able to have a couple of holidays a year and we don't particularly want people not to have a comfortable life. On the contrary, we want to level up. Uh, I was discussing today with a teacher representative of EIS saying that in COVID restricted areas where they are having a teachers going ill because of contracting of COVID, they're teaching mm -hmm. in classrooms of 33, let's say, the average here in Scotland, 33. If you've got enough money, you can buy a private education and get class sizes of 15. Why do we not have class sizes of 15 in the state sector? That That's about levelling up. Socialism, to me, is about levelling up, not levelling down, because we have more than enough wealth. If it was only better distributed, more than enough wealth in society, guarantee every man, woman and child a decent standard and quality of life. Mm. Kerry, well, what, what that, do you think about that? Anybody else want to come on? Sorry. Go on, Kerry. Right. Um, I th I th one of the, on. the biggest myths um, for me is that it's authoritarian. I find that laughable when people are living under capitalism that they consider socialism authoritarian. When you know, where is the democracy in people's workplaces? It's authoritarian. You do what you're bloody well told by your boss and your boss does what their boss tells them and their boss does what their boss tells them. And you only have the rights that they elect to uphold. There's, there's no standard rights and the rights you do have, FYI, were brought to you by socialism. You know, the reason you have a weekend, socialism. The reason your kids aren't up chimneys, socialism. The reason you got an education, socialism. The reason you're not dying of polio, socialism. You know, vaccination programmes and the NHS, all of those things are socialism. It's about choosing to share and achieve our maximum potential together versus fight over the scraps thrown off the table by a handful of billionaires. So I think people really need to grasp, and I think it's difficult for people to do this because it's scary. And I think a lot of people live in denial because they simply would be too afraid to address the reality. The reality is we are increasingly becoming an authoritarian state here, not because of socialism, because of capitalism. Capitalism mm -hmm. is at its heart an authoritarian project. It is not a democratic project. Socialism is, it has to be, because it's a collective movement of people. It's about the equalization and distribution of power, not the hoarding of wealth and power. So I think that yeah. will be a key myth to break. The idea that somehow socialism is more authoritarian than this ridiculously oppressive situation we're living in now. Can I just quickly I go over to Ben? Uh, socialism or barbarism. But what do you think, Ben? <laughs> Well, we, we clearly see barbarism. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to lift this quote from Michael Parenti, but he, he frequently, he, he would repeat that people say socialism failed everywhere. But what's interesting is if you look at a majority of countries in the world, even during the Cold War, but also right now, the majority of countries are social are capitalist and the majority of countries are poor and they have failing corrupt states. I mean, there's countries across the world that have massive poverty, massive unemployment, mm -hmm. massive social problems. And that those are never blamed on capitalism, mm -hmm. even though they're largely caused by capitalism and col colonialism and imperialism, which are all related systems. So mm -hmm. I, I would say in response to the, the original question posed by the commenter, my one of the biggest myths for me is the idea that socialism has failed. I mean, if you if you look around the world in, in many cases, I mean, even in, in countries where there are a lot of mistakes made, socialism has been extremely successful. And in fact, if you look even throughout the Cold War, one of the main reasons in Western Europe and to a lesser extent, the United States, one of the main reasons that that these Keynesian social democratic policies were even allowed was because of the fear of a socialist revolution. One of the reasons yeah. that that labor unionization was at one of the highest levels was because of fears of a socialist revolution. We see that there are numerous economic studies showing that because the United States and Western European countries feared that 
as there were socialist revolutions across Eastern Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, they feared a potential revolution happening among their own working class. So they made deals with capital and they allowed people to unionize. They gave them social benefits. And if you look, even in countries where we were told that socialism has failed, I mean, actually, there are so many other victories that, that were gained, even though the governments were often overthrown. And so it's not necessarily that they were failed, it's that there were coups, there was internal sabotage, there were regime change operations backed by foreign powers and, and internal right-wing oligarchic elites. And, and the last thing I'll say here is, you know, this is really related to a point that, that Tommy made, and I wanted to stress this earlier, and I'll just briefly articulate it, that when we talk about this contradiction of imperialism and nationalism, I think it's really interesting because we also have to understand the difference between fighting for a socialist movement in the imperial core and in the periphery, right? So if you're in the United States, if you're in England, these are imperialist countries that have been imperialist nations for hundreds of years. They're, they were colonial nations and they're now imperialist nations. And, and it makes sense that you can't really struggle with a progressive nationalist movement in these imperial cores because nationalism is almost entirely used by conservative forces to repress the working class. But we have to distinguish the periphery, people, people and nations and areas that have been colonized and subject to imperial exploitation. So in Latin America, it's a unique scenario, but also in a place like Scotland or Wales, it makes sense mm -hmm. that you can have this progressive nationalist movement. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that anti-imperialism is not relevant in the imperial core. It's extremely relevant, and not only in a kind of academic way, not only because solidarity is important everywhere, but also, I think, mm -hmm. in a very real material way. We're constantly told that voters don't care about foreign policy. I don't think that's true at all. I think, actually, if you look at a lot of voters in the Rust Belt in the United States, one of the reasons Donald Trump won in 2016 is even though it was hypocritical, even though it was opportunistic, he was running as an anti-interventionist candidate. He was criticizing yeah. the Iraq war. He was criticizing the war in Libya. And he got a lot of voters among families who have, you know, military members and veterans who maybe, maybe lost a, a life or lost a limb in one of these pointless imperial wars. And even yeah. in the United Kingdom, the last point I'll add is that I think that you can e easily make the argument as well that it was the role of imperialism that that played a key role in in destabilizing the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn with, of course, the attacks of supposed anti-Semitism. I mean, that, that was a larger extension. It's not just about Israel. It's the fact that Jeremy Corbyn is not a British imperialist. He believes in peace. Yeah. He believes in multilateralism. And that's one of the main reasons that they portrayed him as anti-Semitic and anti-Israel and, and all of these ridiculous yeah. smears. And, and we even see, you, you know, Chris mentioned Syriza. I think here, once again, we see that and it was incredible what they accomplished, but we see what happens when you accommodate imperialism. So in 2015, Syriza made a fatal blow yeah. that destroyed the party. And that is they had a referendum in which more than 60 percent of Greeks voted to reject the imperial economic package being forced upon them by the European Union and the International Monetary Fund. And th the vast majority of Greeks voted to go against that austerity package. And what happened? The party gave in and made a deal compromising with the European Union. So just as the Labour Party was decimated by calling for a second Brexit referendum, going against yeah. the democratic will of the people who said they didn't want to be part of this imperialist European Union bloc this, that imposes austerity, that is a neoliberal institution. Just as that decision decimated the Labour Party, it decimated Syriza. And, and even though people might not, a lot of the average voter might not think about foreign policy in an abstract sense, I think these are really concrete examples of how accommodating with imperialism actually does serious damage to the left. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, thanks very much indeed. We're out of time now. We've gone five minutes over. I really want to uh, thank uh, Ben, uh, Kerry Ann and Tommy for a really fascinating discussion this evening. I think it, ben, it was Ben who talked about the winds of change are blowing through Latin America. And I think the winds of change are, are blowing through the, uh, well, certainly England anyway, and uh, hopefully the whole of the, the United Kingdom and, uh, and definitely the, the Labour movement and the, the Labour Party in particular. I'm hopeful that we can build an alternative movement. We absolutely need to do that. And if we're going to rescue everything that was good about the Corbyn project, all that hope and expectation that was invested in that Corbyn project, then I really do believe that we are going to have to kind of find a way of, of working together, 
sorting out our differences and 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 collaborating on the left. It's been a a feature of the left that we've 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 always struggled to achieve that. Uh, and you know we absolutely have to find a way of doing it. And that's why I've been talking to uh, other left wing uh, movements and and political parties speaking to the Workers' Party, speaking with Tusk. Indeed, I've taken a seat as an observer capacity, myself and Sean, on the Tusk Steering Committee. Hmm. We're speaking to uh, trade union figures as well. And I think 2021 is going to be a crunch year for us. Uh, I mean, if we're going to rescue the uh, uh, everything that we hoped would come to pass through the Corbyn project, then I think we're going to have to find a way of, uh, of coming together and striking out on our own. And I hope that you know, some of the people that are that are continuing to fight inside the Labour Party will will actually come with us. Uh, and anybody that's staying behind, then they, they need to certainly speak out and, and not be cowed. Although I think that anybody who does speak out is likely to suffer the consequences because the government is continuing to to step up. I mean, I think that the you know the Labour Party uh, is in a very much a downward uh, spiral now. Uh, I, I, in many ways, I see it in a situation similar to the situation that we were in in this country when the Labour Party was founded, when there was a political duopoly between the Liberals and the Conservatives, and when people recognised that the Liberals no longer really served a useful purpose. The Labour Party was able to uh, pick up the slack and, and, and obviously take over as the main opposition party. And I think that can be achieved again. Uh, but we need next time to ensure that we have a party and we have a movement that has the benefit of belonging to the grassroots and being steered by the grassroots and not being dictated to by elites in, in Westminster and by elites who are in the bureaucracy. So there's a big job for us to do. Obviously, we're being hampered by the COVID crisis, but uh, I think there is a lot of potential out there. There's certainly uh, a lot of anger and a lot of goodwill and a lot of uh, determination, I sense anyway, from speaking to people uh, and the messages that I've received. So, you know, we can look forward with hope and expectation to the to the new year. And uh, just remember that solidarity is key. When we stand together in solidarity, we're incredibly powerful. And, uh, you know, we can make the difference and we will get there. And uh, we will make the change that this country desperately needs. And we will be able to build that, that, that socialist utopia. And, uh, you know, let's kind of make that our goal. Um, we're socialists because we're dreamers. People say I'm a dreamer and they use it as, as a sort of a pejorative term. But uh, I think it's good to be a dreamer. And, uh, you know, I've got a dream that we can build a better world and we can build a decent society. And we can make sure in the fifth biggest economy in the world with our own sovereign currency that we can create an economy that actually works for the majority, not just the few. And we can create that good society by standing together. So thanks again to our uh, guests, Carrie ann Tommy and uh, Ben, as I say. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Tune in again next week. Uh, we'll be on air at 7 p.m. We'll probably be speaking about uh, animal rights next week, potentially. I've um, been trying to get some guests from the Hunt Saboteurs Association to, to join us to talk about some of their work and the way in which the uh, hunting legislation, the uh, the hunting ban is being uh, routinely and uh, disgracefully uh, transgressed by the uh, sort of elites that uh, Boris Johnson likes to hang out with. So if you're uh, free next week at 7 p.m. and you've got an interest in that particular topic, please join us at 7 and we'll see you then. Thanks for watching and good night. Thank you, everybody.